I'm Liz Montgomery and I am the Executive Director of Inland Northwest SIDS Foundation and um, I am a safe sleep educator for Idaho, Montana, Washington and Oregon hospitals who are wanting to get safe sleep certified with the National Cribs for Kids certification program. My name is Dr. Kathleen Webb, I'm a neonatologist by training and I'm the Medical Director of the Inland Northwest SIDS Foundation. So we are here today to teach you about how to keep babies safe. Urban is a safe sleep certified hospital at the gold level. You have a safe sleep policy in place. Um, you should be modeling safe sleep, um, which um, should be, you know, babies on the back and sleep sacks. If, um, you should be educating at discharge or during their stay. Um, and then you should also have portable cribs available for families who might not have that resource might need a safe place for the baby to sleep. So um, that's what it means to be a certified hospital. You also do two community outreach events a year, and you also, um, see what is it? oh, you do self audits. You should be doing some auditing. Um, just kind of depends on what your director has chosen for you for that. So. We, we like to go by and just look at cribs and just make sure they're safe. That's why, you know, every once in a while, you just walk through a unit and say, that, that crib looks good, or oh, look, there's a blanket in that crib. That. So that's that's the the, um, the extent of an audit. It doesn't have to be anything formal. How many of you folks work in labor and delivery? Any L&D staff here? Couple? Good. Okay. Um. Um. Where else? Where else here? Pardon me. Med surge. Med surge. Okay. So you don't see babies particularly. Um. Yeah. Sometimes during this season, yeah. Okay. They all come up with RSV, bronchiolitis. I see. Like okay. That, yeah. So that's great. This is a good good population in the first year for us to focus on safe sleep with. And and for you folks, it's real critical because you're teaching new moms how to keep the baby safe. What what else are the folks in this room doing? Emergency. Pardon me. Emergency. Perfect. Okay. Great. I don't have to convince most emergency people about this work because they see it. So. This is good for you to know this too. And in the back, you do? Daycare. Daycare? Oh, oh great. Good. Both of you? Okay. Perfect. All right. Thanks. Because Gritman has a uh, child care center that they right. have their staff Perfect. attend our training. And if we can't, we can't give this information to our own staff, then <laughs> that means that we don't believe in it very much. So this is great. So this uh, training is brought to you um, from Cribs for Kids, um, which is the national certifying body for the Safe Sleep Hospital program. Uh, Wellspan Health, and then in the Northwest SIDS Foundation. Um, just a disclaimer about images in this presentation um, might be copyrighted, but we're using it for education only. And then, of course, developed by Dr. Goodstein and Barbara Taylor, and then there is our contact information if you need it. Okay. We are available to you if you think of questions after the test. Please don't hesitate to reach out. So our objectives for today um, upon completion of this training, um, you will be able to list the critical input sleep safety messages for parents and caregivers. Um, your key role as educators um, about safe infant sleep, and then the way that you can effectively communicate the safe sleep message. Um, you'll hear Dr. Webb, um, this is kind of how we do our presentation, Dr. Webb does the uh, medical piece, and then I pitch in about, hey, this is what we talk to families about, this might be a good way to get that message across. Okay. And then understand and be able to follow the AAP recommendations. You all have a copy of those in your folder today. There are 19 recommendations for the American Academy of Pediatrics concerning uh, keeping babies safe during sleep. Um, we would be delighted if your, um, your patients, the families, can take away the first three, which are the ABCs of sleep. But let's go a little more detail than that so that we can model correct. Um, behavior all the way through the hospital stay. You bet. And these recommendations were updated in 2016. So if you have not read that article, please um, be familiar with it. And you all, like we said, have, you all have a copy of that. That's not difficult reading. <laughs> it's straightforward. It gets upgraded about every five years, so we should see another. Uh, in maybe two years, we'll see uh, another one. So we're going to talk about the Safe Sleep Hospital designation, um, what that means to be a Safe Sleep Hospital. And then understand and follow your safe sleep policy. And we're going to talk about barriers, okay? There's, um, and we're going to help you work through any um, barriers that you might feel or have had already when it comes to safe sleep. It's easy to say, okay, I know these 19 things, but it's another step entirely to be able to apply them. When parents are exhausted and they just want to get some sleep, and 
and they're they're resistant to doing things the way that we know are safe. So. Okay, so we have a problem. Um, in Idaho, our vital statistics show us that um, our sewage rate, so that's going to be our sewage is sudden, unexpected infant death, and our sewage houses our SIDS deaths and our unsafe sleep accidents in another category of unknown. Dr. Wall will go into that a little bit deeper, but um, just for basic knowledge for right now, um, this is what we're looking at for our death rate, okay, in Idaho. So uh, this is also in your folders. Um, the green is Health District 1, so that's the five northern counties. You have a county map on your um, vital stats page there. Um, and then Health District 2, which is what you're in, is the orange. Nope. Build the orange and the height of that, that means that we have the worst rate in the state in terms of babies dying in their sleep. So we want to impact that. Absolutely. So you can compare our death rates. So we take a five year um, span and we look at our US death rate, or death, death rate is 90 deaths per 100,000 live births. Um, Health District 2 is 186 deaths per 100,000 live births. Twice the natural average. What you can see that's nice to see here is that um, finally we have got Idaho as a state down to around the national average and a little bit better here. Yep, right here. So this just dropped um, last year. So we're pretty proud of that. So um, Washington, for our Washington folks in the room, um, our Better Health Together area definitely is our highest uh, sewage rate in the state. So um, being aware of that, Whitman County, I know that's Kimberly where you are, um, which by the way, they also have a safe sleep certified hospital in Colfax, right? Yeah, Colfax, okay. So just being aware of that, um, so this Better Health Together area, that's our Spokane area too, so we're positioned pretty well as a foundation to be able to affect, um, you know, our prevention work in that area too, so. And we know people cross the border have babies all the time, so Absolutely. you guys are safe on just real quick on Montana, um, their sewage rate right here is 143. Their state sewage rate, they're really, really high. They're one of the, they're six, they're one of six highest sewage rates in the nation is Montana. So we've been doing some work with them. Um, their perinatal council and their hospital association and their health department, Montana State Department of Health, is um, putting out a not necessarily a mandate, but uh, we highly recommend your all birthing hospitals to be certified um, by the end of 2020. So um, they're pushing that out um, from a, a state level to their hospitals. So um, we're working really close with the state of Montana on that. Um, I'll just let you read this, Sarah. So people don't really realize how common this is. People don't talk about it very much. But if you look at that, compared to car accidents, com compared to opioids, guns, and suicide put together, this is the number one cause of death of our babies in the first year of life after age one month. During the first one month, it's usually prematurity and um, congenital wound. Not to say that babies can't die of um, sleep-related infant deaths during that first month. They do. Um, Absolutely the number one cause of death for our babies from one month to 12 months of age. Um, and another piece that we really work hard on is bringing attention to this and bringing awareness to this. And that's why we're doing the um, one reason Bart, um, we're doing a safe sleep class here tonight from six to seven o'clock because um, our friend Bart with Ada County Paramedics has, is walking over 600 miles um, teaching our safe sleep class across the state of Idaho. He left on 9-11 um, from Pocatello, I believe. And he's here, he's just getting here in Moscow, Brian just went to pick him up. So he's here on his journey up the state. And so um, he is teaching our safe sleep class and we have sleep sacks and cribs if families need them. So please, if you guys can send people up, um, it's just bringing awareness to this problem, right? We're gonna buy our shoes. That's in yeah, don't tell me. <laughs> so so and each one of those deaths that you saw on that graph, we have determined um, affects approximately 60 people and it's devastating. Um, I've never lost a baby, but I can tell you, knowing intimately people that have, that folks never get over this. It's it's not it's not natural, it's not normal to lose a child and particularly a healthy infant. And think about all the first responders, think about the extended family and the community, think about the, your ER staff and what that does to them to, have, to lose a baby. It's just like, 
So we want to stop. All right. So it's all about in the messaging, and this is why our hospital program is so important. Is because as a six week certified hospital, you're taking the lead in your community to say, hey, there's a problem. We're going to wrap our arms around this, and we all have to be on the same page about the message that we're spreading from our OB offices to our um, pediatricians to our child cares, and then we're all saying what's best practice, which is American Academy of Pediatrics. Okay. Then parents are more likely to accept it if they're hearing the same message at those multiple sites and we're all speaking with one voice. Um, even parents who are somewhat resistant to this messaging, which some of them are, because they want they want to do things that are unsafe because it helps the baby sleep and helps them sleep. Um, if they hear that message from you, um, you'll notice on your little red hand up there, nurses are the number one trusted group of individuals. You folks pack a lot of power. So just think about how much effect you can have. So if you can buy into this and you can model this and you can teach this, then you will save lives and you won't see it because a baby's not going to walk up to you 10 years later and say, I would have died of a sleep-related death if you had caught my mom. But it's true nonetheless, they will. This works. We know this education works. And so it is a way to save lives that you guys are most effective at getting the message across. Okay, so some definitions when you're talking about parents. Um, so using the term co-sleeping, we really suggest that you stay away from using that term because it can be confusing. Like some families might think co-sleeping is bed sharing and some people might think that co-sleeping is room sharing. So obviously we don't want bed sharing, okay? Um, and that's when an individual sharing sleep surface with an infant is not recommended. And then we want room sharing. Um, so room sharing is recommended for the first 12 months. Okay, so when you're talking with families, if they do say co-sleeping, maybe clarify exactly what they're talking about. Oh, are you talking about bed sharing or room sharing? Just so you can make sure that you're getting the correct message across, right? Okay, a little bit of history. Um, anybody remember the Back to Sleep campaign? Put your baby on its back, on its back, on its back. It swept the nation in the early 90s um, because what was happening is um, what was happening is before this time we were getting eight to ten thousand infant deaths a year in the United States. We get about 3,600 now, um, but before the Back to Sleep campaign, it was eight to ten thousand babies every year dying, and so. What research showed us was that the majority of these babies that were dying were sleeping on their tummies, okay? And so the National Institute of Health launched the Back to Sleep campaign, and in 10 years, our SIDS rates, because that's all we knew back then, was SIDS, or crib death, right? Um, our rates dropped in half, truly saving 5,000 lives every single year. It makes sense that parents want to sleep their babies on their stomach because babies sleep more deeply on their stomach. So they will sleep longer. It's just that that's not a good thing. So the thing that they want most of all is the safety of their baby, but they think what they want most of all in the moment is just to go back to sleep. So that's the kind of head we will fire. So um, in night it was um, side or back sleeping for a little bit and then um, babies were just rolling onto their tummies. And so since 1996, infants, um, it's the recommendation to place them wholly on their backs, okay? So uh, we had this uh, incredible decrease in deaths, um, but after about 10 years, our, our rate started to plateau. They stopped going down. So back to sleep wasn't the, the only answer. There's something else going on here. And so research happened, um, and then the AAP used that research to make new recommendations that came out in 2011, um, and those recommendations launched the Safe to Sleep campaign. This is National Institute of Health. In your folders, you have examples of um, brochures from the National Institute of Health Safe to Sleep campaign. One of those is particularly designed for healthcare professionals, so you can look at that one in yellow. That's helpful. And the other, there's some ones in there that are designed for parents and grandparents. So um, now we're in the Safe to Sleep campaign, and um, those are those these are the recommendations we're going to go over with you um, today. Okay. All right, Dr. Webb. Okay. So we're going to talk about what it means, the difference between SUIDs, an unexpected infant death, and SIDS. SIDS um, 
it was a diagnosis that was used a lot um, earlier. That's all we had. And so it, people became aware that many of these babies who we were calling SIDS deaths were dying of different phenomena. So we tried to parse that and we came up with this umbrella term that's called SUIT, sudden unexpected infant death. And it includes SIDS. And the definition of SIDS is a baby who dies um, who after it, it, you know, it was previously healthy and after a full investigation, meaning um, they got a history, they got a death scene investigation, they got a full autopsy, we still couldn't find a reason for it. We had no idea why this baby died. That's what SIDS is. SUID, on the other hand, is a larger term that, that can encompass a lot more deaths. That might be from a variety of other causes. Um, for example, it might be a metabolic disease or a cardiac disease. If the baby appeared to be healthy, but was really harboring a reason why they were at risk of dying. Um, so um, does that make sense, the difference between SIDS and SUID? We still tend to use them interchangeably. Um, and it's not fair to do that, because many of these deaths are, are, are Explained. And as time goes by, the category of SIDS becomes smaller and smaller as we, are, as we get better at finding out the reason why these babies are dying. And a lot of the reasons why many of these babies are dying is from an unsafe sleep environment. Um, and we'll talk about some of that in a little, a little bit, but um, the number one cause under the sewage umbrella, umbrella right now is accidental suffocation and strangulation and death. And that's what's happening in most of these cases, where the baby becomes entrapped or becomes hypoxic and can't save themselves. So a baby has to do two things in order to survive a situation where they're in trouble because they're not getting enough air for First thing they have to do is rouse themselves. And many babies can't do that effectively. Babies in general can't do that as effectively as you and I. Dog barks, baby may not wake up. Um, and babies who've been exposed, say, for example, to nicotine in utero have a really distorted arousal mechanism and they don't wake up very well. The other thing the baby has to do is save themselves. So no matter how much the baby's awake, if they're trapped and their face is stuck between the wall and the mattress, they're still going to die because not only do they have to wake up, but they have to save themselves. And those are the gist of some of the recommendations for moving things out of the bed that can attract them on their head. Okay, this is, don't panic. This is just a slide that shows us the three factors that, generally speaking, are involved when a baby dies of a sleep-related um, infant death. Um, and some of our some of our um, our challenges are directed at some of these circles, and some are not. So, for example, the first circle up on the upper left is a critical period of development, the first year of life, and more specifically, from two to four months. There's another peak during the first week, but um, we'll leave that for right now. My point here is there's nothing we can do about this. We've just got to get them through this critical time without putting them in a situation where they might die. So that's why we focus our, 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 our information on how to take care of babies during the first year. That's where the data's been done. The second circle that says a vulnerable infant means that some babies are just at more risk of this than others. Um, and that could be anything from genetics or to in utero exposure to tobacco. Um, it can be um, a certain psychosocial group. Um, so there's a few, a few external, uh, there's a few factors. Um, geographical location, um, young maternal age, low socioeconomic status. Those things we can affect. Prematurity is one of them. We can affect those. But it's hard. Some of them we can't at all. You know, genetics, we can't do anything about that. The third category, this exogenous stressor, is the one that we have the most ability to change. And that's the focus of our educational efforts and what we're going to focus on today. And that's an exogenous stressor, which means something in the environment that is happening to put this baby in a situation where they can't breathe. Okay, it might be increased temperature that makes the baby much more sleepy. It might be pillows and blankets. It might be sleeping face down. Um, any number of things that are in the sleep environment. And that we can teach to, to be more safe. Any questions about that? That's a, that's a, it's a busy slide, but it helps to understand that it's not just a single event, but it's, it's a, 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 like a perfect storm of three different factors coming together.
Okay. Yes. So in that line of the vulnerable infant, we should think about the premature baby um, and the low birth weight baby as some of the highest at risk. So that can be, you know, 34 weeks. It doesn't have to be a tiny preemie that you guys really see here. It could be a baby who's just a few weeks early, and it can be a baby who's just underweight. Both of those infants, independent factors from each other, put the baby at higher risk of dying from a sleep-related accident. Okay, young maternal age, maternal smoking with pregnancy, late or no prenatal care. What I'd like to say about caffeine is it's critical, and we could cut the rate in half again if we could prevent women from smoking while they're pregnant. What happens is there are changes in the fetal brain with exposure to nicotine. And those, those changes in the brain make it harder for those babies to wake up. Um, we also see it postnatally, but it's most significant in the prenatal. So we'd like women not to smoke at all, even when their babies are already born. We, we particularly don't want them to smoke when they're pregnant. People ask me about vaping. Vaping um, contains nicotine. I mean, that's why people vape unless they're vaping THC or something else. But, um, but so it puts the babies at the same risk. Um, so it's not protected against um, sudden, un sudden unexpected infant death to vape instead of smoke a cigarette. There's probably some ingredients in, um, in cigarette smoke that are also harmful. We haven't really teased that out, but we know that vaping is not a good thing to do around babies either. Okay. Two to three more times more common in African American, American Indian, and Alaska Native children, babies. It's true for first people around the world, the Maori in New Zealand, um, the Aborigines in Australia, they're also more um, susceptible to sleep related infant deaths. So, those are some of the populations that we focus our teaching efforts on. We particularly want to look in this area at our Native American channels because we have such high number of them and they're such a risk. Okay, interestingly enough, Hispanic families and Asian Pacific families are at lower risk of sudden unexpected infant death. We do not know why, but it is protective. Righty, so here we are. These are the 19 um, recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, the message that we want parents to learn is the ABCs of safe sleep. So, babies sleep alone on their backs in a crib. Obviously, we cannot get all 19 recommendations out to them during their stay here at the hospital, right? So um, that's why we um, form our class, the ABCs of safe sleep. That's, um, and we go over just this basic message of baby sleep alone, um, meaning in their own, right, in their own sleep environment, on their backs, and in a crib with nothing in their cribs. So, I mean, we want you to do more than just, hey, make sure baby sleeps alone on the back of a crib with your education. But um, we know, you know, families have a lot to remember, so let's at least get that that message across. That would be the minimum. That's the basic, and it's easy to remember. A, B, C. So um, we put them on the backs of the ambulances throughout the county, so that when people pull up at us, Ada County, when somebody pulls up at a stoplight behind an ambulance, they've got this poster with the A, B, C, of sleep, safe sleep on it. I've got a sticker on my little free library that says that too. Okay. Um, so the first recommendation, and if you look at your articles, so that's number one. Um, it's going to make the biggest, the biggest bang for our back buck. Is always place the baby on his or her back to sleep for nights and a night. I don't think there's many people who haven't heard that message, but the implementation of it is very difficult. There's been some recent data that's come out that says the, a minority of parents are actually doing this. Also, if you look at babies in the first part of the night compared to later on in the night. They may start out on the back, but by the time we've gotten all through the night and they've been up for a couple of feedings, they end up on the sides. So um, why back to sleep? Um, you can look at those statistics. I don't have to read them to you. But the idea is that the baby's face down is rebreathing carbon dioxide. Oxygen levels are dropping. CO2 levels are, are increasing. This can lead to apnea. It can also just lead by itself to death from suffocation. Also, when the baby's on their stomach, they tend to hold on to heat more. They're sort of curled up, and they, the, um, the heat pools in the core. It can also be associated with decreases in the mechanisms of, of um, stabilization for heart rate and respiratory patterns. 
Okay. Heart rate and blood pressure can be affected by this. Oh. They're just less stable on their bellies, but they will sleep deeper, they will sleep longer. So we understand why parents end up doing this when they can't get their used. Okay, we're going to show you a little video about this because some parents are afraid, and actually this comes more from grandparents, they're worried about the baby choking when they're laying on their back. Um, so they think, well, if I put them on their side or on their tummy, then the, the vomit can leak out. But what we as health professionals can understand and teach our parents is that actually gravity is our friend when we're on our back because the material is more likely to fall back into the esophagus rather than fall forward into the throat. So we're going to show you a little video on that. Um, really quick, on the back to sleep, and when you're talking to parents or grandparents or whoever, make sure that they're not using any sort of device that locks them onto their back or straps them onto their back. We're not no using any sort of wedging. We're not rolling up receiving blankets and sticking them on either side of the baby so they don't roll, okay? All of that kind of stuff can be um, suffocation hazards. And you guys know um, that babies will eventually start to roll, right? So a lot of people ask us, what do you do when they start to roll? You know, we don't want parents standing there staring at their babies all night, so every time they roll over, they roll them back. Once the baby is um, safe, rolling both back to front and front to back, you can let them choose their sleeping position. And at the end of when they're on their stomachs, it's okay, because then you know that the baby can ride themselves. But it's in the in-between stage where they're just starting to roll, then you need to be a little more careful. And making sure that you start babies on their backs for sleep, and then um, making sure that there's nothing in the crib. All right, so this is Nurse Gale. Um, we, oh, first of all, this exact illustration is gonna be in the NIH um, Safe to Sleep book, Safe Sleep for Your Baby, on page 16. If you need to use that as a resource to talk to families about this. Also, this video is on our website, inwsids.org, under the resource tab. So oftentimes videos can you know, be easier um, for families to understand other than you just saying, well, because of gravity, da 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 Hey, I have this great video. So this is the exact video um, that's on our website. Hi, my name is Gail Bagwell, and I am an advanced practice nurse here at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And I'm going to talk to you today about why babies don't choke when lying on their backs. When a baby is ready to go to bed, you want to put them in a safety-proof crib on their backs. Nothing should be in the crib. You should have a nice fitted mattress, um, fitted sheet on your mattress, as well as no bumper pads and no toys or other stuff in the baby's crib. The baby needs to go onto the back because the American Academy of Pediatrics has found that by placing the babies on their backs, there's a less incidence of the baby dying from sudden infant death syndrome or other sleep-related deaths. A lot of people will ask, but won't my baby choke if they're laying on their back and they start to vomit? And the answer is actually no, oh, they will not. When your baby sleeps on his back, the air pipe, which is also known as the trachea, lies on top of the food pipe, which is known as the esophagus. While on the back, if your baby spits up, it is harder for the spit up to go into the air pipe due to gravity. However, when your baby sleeps on his stomach and spits up, it is easier for him to choke because the spit up will gather at the back of the throat and can go right into the air pipe, causing the baby to breathe the spit up into their lungs. So it is always best to put your baby on their back to sleep for all sleeps, nap time and bedtime. So just another way to get that message across to families. Um, the basic thing what I say is, well, if your baby's sleeping on its tummy and it spits up, it can breathe that spit up and breathe it right back into their lungs and they can aspirate. So that's my basic message to families. And it's that aspiration. And parents aren't going to understand the word aspiration, but that getting the material down into the lungs, that's the most dangerous. Okay, we're going to talk about reflux just a little bit because this is something that's caused a lot of controversy in the medical profession. We still have providers out there who want to treat babies with reflux by um, changes in position, um, and they want to elevate them. Um, the National uh, Association for um, Gastroenterology, for Pediatric Gastroenterology, um, is in agreement with the American Academy of Pediatrics that this is not helpful. So um, putting a baby at an angle doesn't work. It works for adults, 
So if I go to the doctor and say I have reflux, the doctor may recommend that I elevate the head of my bed. We have studied it in infants and it doesn't help. So it's not useful and it's also somewhat dangerous because if you prop the baby up at an angle, they may roll and fall into an unsafe position. It is true that putting them on their tummy will decrease reflux, um, but the risks of dying of sleep-related death outweighs the benefit of treating the reflux. The benefit of the treat, treating reflux um, is just not going to be as much as this dying from SIDS by laying it on your tummy or dying from sleep-related into death. So um, that's why both associations recommend back sleep, back sleeping and non-elevated sleeping, even in cases of reflux. The one exception to this is a baby who's truly at risk from a life-threatening reflux leading to um, aspiration. And we're not just talking about bad reflux, we're talking about babies with uncorrected um, cleft larynxes, for example, or pyramid band, or some anatomical problem that makes it so that they can't protect their airways and they will aspirate and they can die from that. So those babies, may be placed on their tummies. They're still not going to be elevated because elevating out of bed doesn't work, remember. So they may be placed on their tummies because the risk of death from aspiration in those cases may outweigh the risk of death from sudden unexpected infant death. We talked about that. Okay, I kind of blend the two. Yeah, you bet. So making sure that you're not tipping those bassinets um, at the hospital. Um, that's not a recommended practice. That's modeling unsafe sleep for people. Now let me clarify that. That's for if a baby's in a respiratory distress, they may need to have their bed elevated. But that's not a baby you're going to be sending home like that. So and that's temporary. A baby going home, say on a wedge or with their head, head of the bed elevated, it's not recommended. So again, if we don't need to do it, we shouldn't be doing it in the hospital because we want to model what the parents should be doing at home. So if they see you elevating the head of the bed, they may think, oh, this is what I should do at home. If there's a specific medical indication or elevating the head of bed, and I'm thinking of respiratory distress, then of course you will do that, but not for reflux. And not just because, oh, that's the way we always do it, we always have the head of the bed elevated. Um, there are providers out there, there are physicians out there, um, nurse practitioners who haven't read this data. This data has been out there for 11 years now. So it, it takes the average provider about that long to learn to change their practice. So that's on us. We have to get in front of the providers too um, to teach them this information. And they're going to say, and they do, well, let me see the data on that. So then we have to bring out the papers. Don't do that. So um, eventually you will stop seeing providers who are ordering a wedge and a sling for, for reflux for babies. Um, and your hospital policy, I don't recall specifically, but it should say something about elevation of the head of that. Don't do it unless there's an indication. Um, on that note, I guess if you guys do have to do something that's um, in the baby's best interest that's not following the safe sleep recommendations, um, please educate the families about why you're doing this and that they will not be doing this at home. Um, that's a really, really important um, step to remember when you're, um, I don't know, you have to do something. Sometimes we do things like putting a baby in a hat, for example, because there's a medical need, but then we forget to not do it once that medical need is no longer there. So babies tend to go home with interventions that they don't really need anymore. So we just need to be aware that if we're doing something that doesn't follow these recommendations, we need to be very proactive about removing it before discharge and talking with parents about the safety risk at home. All right, so the next recommendation is a flat, firm surface on the heels of uh, incline sleep, right? Um, so a flat firm surface such as a safety approved crib mattress covered by a fitted sheet. Um, on this note for your um, bassinets here at the hospital, you guys shouldn't be wrapping blankets around it, I know, around the mattress. Um, I know that was something that a couple years ago, like you guys have been certified for about four years. That was one thing that, that was happening here um, was that we were wrapping blankets around mattresses, which probably isn't an issue here at the hospital, but what is it modeling to families? Right? That you should go home and wrap a blanket around your mattress, maybe the quilt that grandma made or whatever. So, um, did you want to say something? Yeah, I do. The reason for that is that those blankets can become unwrapped and can become entangled around the baby. And particularly in the home environment where you're not supervising it well, they're not a fitted flat sheet. So, um, you want to avoid it. Do you still see that happening in your hospital? 
upstairs we don't have sheets for the big cribs, so we just like put our uh, flat sheets for our normal beds, but we use little elastic clips okay. and clip them tight underneath the Okay, mattress. that should work. Uh, what you don't want is a loose blanket that's just top. Yeah. Okay. No. Especially with the bigger babies. Yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. 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 Babies we see more problems with with your age range than we do with the community age. But if there's an option for a fitted crib sheet, that would be best. So, um, you know, if it's a real problem and you're not finding yourself in a safe situation, you need to talk to your nursing supervisor about it because that's part of the requirements of maintaining the certification is that those crib sheets be secure. So if, if like you don't have enough clips or it's, it's not working, you know, you need to be bringing it up. Be an advocate for your patients. We want to keep these kids safe. Right. So we mentioned earlier that room sharing is recommended for the first year. Um, the, keeping the baby's sleep area closed but separate from where you and others are sleeping. Um, we recommend um, pushing that pack and play or bassinet away from the adult bed. This is at home, well, at the hospital too, just in case things can still fall into the baby's sleep environment. Um, just um, on Sunday, one of the gals that, um, well, Kimberly, it was Ashley. Um, she just had a new baby, and she has been to our safe sleep class numerous times. And um, she, has, she goes, Liz, Liz, do you tell people to not put the pack and play up against the adult bed? Because I found um, a pillow over the top of her little one, her yeah, two months old, because it had bed. fallen off in the middle of the night. And I'm like, yes, yes, we say that. And she's like, oh, I didn't even think about it, right? And she's very well versed in safe sleep. I mean, and she's very good about following it, but right? Like, who would have thought? So making sure that pack and place pushed away from the adult bed. One of our advocates lost a baby um, in daycare um, when the baby reached up and grabbed a blanket from, was it wasn't an adjacent crib? It wasn't even her crib. And pulled it off and suffocated. So, I mean, these are just things we have to think about that can happen. And, and um, you know, it doesn't take very long. And, and babies, they're not going to cry out. They're not going to scream and struggle. They're just going to die. So we just have to do that work for them to keep that environment safe. Sure. So we mentioned um, 3,700 deaths in 2017 from sewage. Over half of those deaths occurred in the adult bed. This is really controversial. We get it. There are many families who really feel like the bed is the best place for their baby to sleep. And one of the reasons for this is that it does promote breastfeeding. And we want breastfeeding to happen. So we need to give parents safe ways to breastfeed and promote breastfeeding without bed sharing. So we recommend several things, you know, so we're all telling people what they shouldn't do, but we want to tell them what they should do, you know, to help them get through those difficult times. So, um, for example, setting a timer on the phone so that um, if, if they fall asleep nursing, we want them to nurse in bed. Because if you nurse on a couch and you accidentally fall asleep, that's a much more dangerous place for that baby. So we want them to nurse in bed, but we don't want them to sleep with the baby. And everybody's going to fall asleep nursing a baby. It's, it's a given. Nobody can be that exhausted and not doze off. But, we, but it's a dose-dependent relationship between how much time the baby sleeps in the adult bed and their risk of dying. So any amount that you can limit that. So make it easy on yourself. Put that bassinet you know, 18 inches away, but have it right there. Set a little alarm so that five or 10 minutes after you start nursing, you're gonna be reminded to wake up and put the baby back to bed. Um, strip away the pillows and the blankets so that it helps to keep you as a nursing mom awake, but also if you do doze off, those pillows and blankets won't be there to smother your baby. So a number of things we can do to promote breastfeeding that don't involve bed sharing. Um, it's very difficult because there are a lot of families that are going to say, I'm not going to have a bed chair. If that happens to you, you just snuggle up to the other 18 recommendations. The last, you know, if there are some people that you're just not going to be able to convince. You give them the information. You say, this is the recommendation. And then you go back and you focus on those things that you can agree on. Isn't it wonderful that you're breastfeeding your baby? That's going to be For sure. So some other ideas for families. Um, as soon as you get baby out to feed, set an, uh, like she said, an alarm on your cell phone, it'll go off after five or 10 minutes, whatever you set it for. Get up, go grab a glass of water, then come back to bed to feed. Um, watch a movie, read a book, play on your cell phone. You have a partner help you stay awake. 
Um, just some ideas because this is where you know the majority of our babies are dying is in that adult bed. What we've seen also is as we study this in more in depth, many babies will start out in their bassinets and pack in place at the beginning of the night. By the end of the night, the parents are so beside themselves because they won't sleep that that baby is in bed. And um, I can understand when that would happen. I remember those days. You would you would do anything. You would stand the kid up on his head in the corner that would help you get five more minutes of sleep. So. But, so um, in the hospital, um, making sure that if you do come in on uh, somebody, either dad or mom or whoever, um, nodding off to sleep with the baby, holding the baby, that you um, educate, educate, educate on the dangers of um, falling asleep with your baby, um, and that you document every single time, right? Um, what is your policy for bed sharing? We need pretty Yeah, we have a sign in their free clinic. We have a bowl and safe sleep stuff to go over in the free clinic and they sign saying that they agree to do it. Okay. If and if they, they don't, if yeah. they don't, then I know we've had them sign a form saying that they are not being compliant with safe sleep, just so that we're all on the same page that we've educated them. And they're choosing not to be compliant with the with not that sharing. So that's what we had one recently but she just wanted baby to right. her, and so we just showed her again the safe sleep, went over it with her, and then just had her sign the thing that she was choosing not to do it. It's, some, some hospitals choose to do that, and some don't. The only argument against that is that if you get really busy, signing that consent form sometimes sounds like, well, do you want fries with that? Do you want to sleep with your baby? Okay, sign here. So what um, you're saying is right. But we have somebody who specifically does our free clinic and sits down with the mom. Yes. Right. The so so then they have time to do yes. that work. Sounds because I know right. sometimes you guys don't. You got a list of long as your arm of things you got to do before discharge. I know that. You know. So so another thing I would recommend is not waiting until discharge to start this teaching. Embed it in the interactions you're having along the way. And if you see, we promote skin to skin. We want skin to skin. This is important neurologically, psychosocially. But we want. To, to do skin to skin safely, which means that a mom or the dad who's holding that baby has to be awake. If they're not awake, they can roll over and that baby can fall, that baby can come into trap, and set yourself up for what they might do at home. So, um, another argument, um, or well, some other things that um, people say is well, um, there's other cultures that have a lower SIDS rate and um, they sleep with their babies. Um, so please know that those cultures usually have firm mats on the floor, a separate mat for their baby, um, and they don't use soft bedding. Think about our big fluffy American beds, right? They're way too soft for an infant. Um, chin to chest can happen, pitching up babies' airways, um, big pillows, big blankets. We have really soft American beds and we do not sleep on, well, most of us don't sleep on, you know, mats on the floor. So, um, and some of those other cultures also have a lot of other factors that we don't have. So if you look at um, the, the Scandinavian countries, for example, they have universal health care. They have home visiting nurses that come from every family. They pay their families to get their kids immunized. They have a lot of things. They have paid maternal leave and paternal leave. They have a lot of things that we don't have help to keep babies safe from sudden unexpected infant death, not just um, sleep the, sleeping with the baby. So it's part of the whole package. So just to bring a, um, you a, aware of some studies that um, have been done, infants less than eight months of age, the incident of death in cribs is 0.63 deaths per 100,000 infants, but then um, when we add bed sharing, um, increases that um, those deaths to 25 deaths per 100,000. That's a big increase. It can be up to 40 times more common in bed sharing situations than in non bed sharing situations. So, risk for sudden infant death is greatest if sharing a sleep surface, intermediate if in another room, and then least if an infant sleeps in the same room without bed sharing. I was always confused about when some of these this, these data points are referring to SIDS and some of them are referring to SUID, and I'm like, what's what? And you know, as I said, since it is when we've done a full investigation, we can't find the reason. Some of these still are accidental suffocation and strangulation. That we just can't find it. 
it's hard to identify that on an autopsy. In an adult, they have fatigue. I guess it's a big struggle while they're trying to get out of the suffocation environment. Babies, they don't struggle. They don't, they don't have that much negative pressure, so they don't get, you know, fatigue. They don't get signs of struggle. Uh, so it's hard to make that diagnosis. And some of these studies that we show are from like 2003. So that's back when everything was since. Okay, so that's probably what else. Okay, so. Soft bedding versus firm bedding um, poses five times the greater risks. Our soft bedding, infants who sleep on their stomachs on soft bedding are 21 times greater risk than those infants that sleep on their back on firm bedding. So, so this, this is really important. Yeah, this just says that those risk factors are multiplicative. So you start piling them up and the risk grows exponentially. That's, it goes back to that triple, triple risk model I'm saying. If you start combining factors, the risk goes way up. So take cigarette smoking and bed sharing and tummy sleeping and bedding and you start just piling on the risk factors that this was way up okay so this is the recommendation um a flat firm surface on their backs and a safety proof mattress free of loose materials including stuffed toys fluffy blankets and bumper pads we're going to get into more of the unsafe sleep products um, here towards the end so we want an empty crib, nothing in that crib except the baby. Wearable blankets are rec are suggested if you, um, if you feel your baby needs that extra layer for warmth. We'll get into that in just a minute. So, okay, so unsafe sleep environments, um, we have room sharing, or um, excuse me, we have bed sharing. So some of these are some examples of um, some things that can happen in the dangers of um, bed sharing. That's from, it all. Remember, it takes five pounds of pressure for five minutes for an infant to suffocate. And that is the fact that we, I share with families at Safe Sleep Class because they might not know how you know fast it can happen. That's the weight of your arm. Yep, there's the, enough weight in the human arm to suffocate an infant. A couch, if you, if you sleep, share a surface and that surface is a couch, they have a towards that as well. Um, bed sharing with overlay, the nose or mouth can become obstructed or the weight of the adult can constrict the infant's chest. Couch sleeping, babies can slip down between the cushion and the adult. Just like on the bed, the airway can be blocked or the chest can be crushed. All right, so what about our soft bedding? We're gonna talk about some things um, that are unsafe. This includes sheepskin, stuffed animals, and toys. Totally unsafe um, because there's strangulation suffocation housing. Okay. Um, so crib bumpers are considered unsafe and have been banned in several municipalities throughout the country. Um, New York was actually the latest state to ban the sale of crib bumpers. Um, also with crib bumpers, you might get asked about mesh crib bumpers. Um, those can be a strangulation hazard. Crib bumpers, baby, babies can roll into them, they can suffocate, they can get wrapped up in them. Um, so they are not recommended. Our cribs are really, really safe now. Um, they have to meet very strict safety guidelines. The slats are close together. Um, we're okay with a bump on a head versus a, a suffocation. Okay. okay, so you understand that crib bumpers were developed because babies were getting their heads stuck between the crib rails. And this was killing babies. So we developed crib bumpers to protect against that. But what we really needed to do was just put the slats closer together. And that's what we've done. So a baby can still hurt themselves without a crib bumper. They can get their arms stuck and they can break an arm. But we'd rather have that happen than them strangle, strangling on a, the tie for a crib bumper or a suffocation in a crib bumper. So we have a crib bumper exchange. We'll, we'll give a family a sleep sack in exchange for their crib bumpers. They still sell these, they're very cute. They match the wallpaper. We don't want to see them used. Okay, so overheating is definitely a risk factor. Our babies, play, our warm babies like to sleep longer and deeper. So um, not letting the baby overheat during sleep, trying a onesie with a wearable blanket instead of loose blankets, keeping the room temperature comfortable for an adult. Um, a recommended room temperature is 65 to 72 degrees. Um, we talk about that. Um, also with our families, a wearable blanket. So um, the U.S. hands these up, yes. Yeah. So we really, as a gold certified hospital, you really should be using those exacts, okay? Um, I'm going to add, we just, yeah. you know, we know, we see this, this is one of those barriers that we're talking about. These, these come between what we know is best practice and what we actually live. 
No, that's reality of your situation. They're not in stock. So we have to figure out what to do about that. So as they're not in stock, we need to model safe swaddling, which we'll get into. So safe swaddling is only at chest level, not up over the shoulders, not too tight, not too loose. And that's right. one exception to having a blanket in the crib is if it's being used correctly as a swaddle device. Yeah. So, um, okay, so this is the this is actually the preemie sleep sack. Um, these are really nice because you can swaddle under the arms or over the arms for the babies, okay? Some babies like their arms out. You don't have to swaddle for a safe sleep recommendation. That is not a recommendation. So um, we just talked to families about trying to use a sleep sack or um, just regulating that room temperature and using jammies in a onesie. It's totally fine. Okay. When we say it's not a recommendation, it's not a disrecommendation either. Swaddling is fine. It's it's not it's not protective, but it's not dangerous either unless you do it after a certain point. If you do it unsafely, then it's it's not good. Um, but after after the baby starts to roll, you need to get away from swaddling because what's going to happen if a swaddling baby rolls onto the baby's belly? And so yeah. eight weeks is your hard cutoff to stop swaddling with their arms in. If they show signs of rolling before that, then the, those arms have got to come out of the swaddle. Okay. So avoiding overheating, um, excessive excessive clothing, head covering, making sure that you tell parents that um, hats come off once they get home for sleep. Um, they, you know, obviously you guys know why you use them in the hospital um, is to help them regulate that body temperature. But once they get home, those hats should not be used during sleep because they can come off, get over the baby's face, and they can cause a baby to overheat. So, some babies need a hat to maintain their temperature in the first few days enough so that it's safe to send them home from the hospital without being hypothermic. But that is going to be days. It's not weeks, it's not months. So, talk to your parents about, you know, if we're going to send you home with this hat, and that should be the rare baby that goes home with a hat. Of course, if it's snowing outside and the baby's going to be outside, he wears a hat, but we're talking about for sleep here. So, the only time it's okay to wear a hat for sleep is in that first week of life with certain babies who can't maintain it. It should be a rare exception. Okay, and here are your recommendations for swaddling um, that we just talked about. Um, safe swaddling, we talked about that, making sure it's at chest level, not too tight, not too loose, and you're teaching the families. I mean, if you guys are giving the sleep sacks out, why not just take them out of the package and put them in, right? And then that's their sleep sack to go home. Maybe that's what you do, I don't know. For those of you in med surge or whatever, you're going to need the bigger sleep sacks probably. Most of them on the newborn. They don't have the wings, so I'm Here, I got not really the effective way of holding baby. So right. they won't oh, have this. Sorry. They'll just look like that. So um, they don't come with the swaddle. Yes, yeah, they only come with the swaddle in the newborn. It's kind of big size. So make sure that you have the bigger size sleep sacks available for, especially in childcare. Yep, and then of course in your for the older babies okay the non-newborns all right so let's sum it up basically a baby shouldn't sleep anywhere but in their crib okay they could get trapped wedged injured rolled on or suffocated now is a baby gonna fall asleep in a car seat of course they are We're gonna yeah. okay sorry it's okay <laughs> all right so dr webb yes Breastfeeding. Can you talk to us about breastfeeding? Okay, we did a little bit already. What I can tell you from the point of view of safe sleep is that breastfeeding is protective. It gets some unexpected if you die. So a 50% risk reduction in sales of the babies are breastfed. There, um, it is, again, a dose-dependent phenomenon. The more mom nurses, the more breast milk. It's breast milk, not just breastfeeding. Um, so pumped breast milk will also help. The more they nurse, the better the odds are of surviving the infancy. Um, so um, breastfed babies are more easily aroused. We all know that, which is one of the reasons why new breastfeeding moms, you know, can tear their hair out because babies will cluster feed and they will want to nurse every two hours. Um, but the, but the flip side of that, the good side of that, is that when they're not so deeply asleep, they're at lower risk of dying. Um, it's protective against illnesses. We know respiratory um, diseases and ear infections. That, are, that also increase your risk of sudden unexpected death um, are decreased in um, babies who are breastfed. Um, and then lots of good antibodies that we, we've talked about and we know about um, that are protective um, and help babies to thrive. So there are lots of good reasons to breastfeed, safe sleep, and keeping protecting babies from sudden unexpected death is one of them. All right, let's not forget a couple of other important things. Smoking, we talked about. 
Um, do not allow smoking around the baby. Even so, secondhand smoke is bad. Even thirdhand smoke. The thirdhand smoke is when there's smoke in the clothing that the person wears who smoked. So cover gown can be helpful. You can read the stats there. Um, yes. Okay, pacifiers. Lots of you may not know that pacifiers are protection. I get so unexpected for that. There's a couple reasons for this. One is that babies who are suck, sucking on a pacifier are not as deeply asleep as babies who are not. But another reason is it probably sets the airway open a lot. Interestingly enough, this effect does not decrease if the pacifier falls out of the baby's mouth. So it's not necessary to suck the pacifier back into the mouth of a sleeping baby. But it is helpful. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that it should be delayed until the establishment of breastfeeding. How long does that take? It depends on mother and baby diet. I have one baby of mine, he was my second kid, who breastfeeding was well established after four hours. And um, um, I had another one that it took a couple of weeks. So the American Academy of Pediatrics does not specify how long that is. But once breastfeeding is well established, you can introduce a pacifier. Um, okay. Pacifier use does not interfere with breastfeeding. You will hear mixed messages on this. Um, there are some data that suggest in the short term it might, and particularly if it's introduced too early, but in the long term it does not. Um, and um, babies need to suck, the, and sometimes it's non nutritive. And if you talk to physical therapists and occupational therapists, they'll tell you this. Okay, vaccines. Is there a relationship between vaccines and SIDS? Yes. Vaccines are protective. Babies who get their vaccines on time are less likely to die of sudden unexpected infant death than babies who are not immunized more times. Um, people are afraid um, that vaccines cause immunizations because of the difficulty in sorting out the difference between correlation and cause and effect. We as healthcare providers, we know what that means. It means that just because two things happen at the same time does not mean that one caused the other. So, when you're in peak cis age range, you're getting a lot of vaccines, right? You're getting two month shots, four month shots, or six month shots, and um, and those are the times when babies are more likely to die. So lots of people will come up with a story. I had a friend whose baby got their vaccines, and three days later they were dead. This is not uncommon, but it's not that the vaccines cause the death. It's that the two things happen about the same time. If you do controlled studies, um, there is no data to support vaccines causing some unexpected infant death or autism for that matter. But there are, is good data to su suggest that vaccines are protected. Questions about that? I see some of this. Um, again, if you have a family who's vaccine resistant, all you can do is present the data. Separate out, this is another thing I want you to do for me. That may be difficult. Maybe you've had a bad feeling about vaccines. Maybe you've had a bad experience. So you need to separate out your own emotional response to what the data says. And so when you are working in the hospital and teaching these families, your job is to present things as evidence-based. So you may have certain feelings about something. You may practice something. You may not give your own kids um, Personal. You may decide that you don't want to vaccinate your own children on schedule. In the hospital, when you're with your families, you are obligated to teach evidence-based medicine. This is what the data supports, and this is what I want you to teach. It's hard, but sometimes you have to set aside your own feelings and teach by the data. Okay? Is that, is that something that you guys feel like you can do? Okay. That can be hard. It can be hard for me, too. Sometimes I get my own stuff things. It may not be rational, but they're, they're real feelings. Okay, so oftentimes um, when you're talking to that family, um, I highly encourage you, you can start your safe sleep conversation with, so where's your baby going to sleep when you get home? Okay, and that would open up that safe sleep discussion. Um, sometimes they're going to read a lot of things that you've never heard about, because guess what? There's a lot of products on the market and new ones that are not safe for sleep, and but they're marketed heavily for sleep, okay? So... I'm going to go through some that um, are some common questions that we get at our safe sleep classes, so from our parents. 
our caregivers. So um, we get questions about it, uh, the baby boxes. Um, I don't know if you guys have any of these around in your community. Have you seen these? Have you heard them? Anybody heard of them? Okay. Okay. All right. So in Finland, um, they have one of the lowest infant mortality rates in the world. And something unique that they do is they give a box to every single baby born, and they have for years, 75 years, I think. And it's full of goodies for the newborn baby um, and things, but um, that's, that's okay. not really where they sleep. They oh, also they did. Right, but not now. Right. So so that's why they keep, it's like a tradition, right? So the, there's companies that um, sell this box and say, oh, hey, see Finland, they have low infant mortality rates because they give out this box, right? And their babies all sleep in this box, which we know isn't true. They have things like you mentioned before, you know, free health care, maternal and paternal leave, um, things like that. So we would, obviously this box does not meet Consumer Product Safety Commission standards for a crib, bassinet, cradle, or portable crib, okay? Um, it's a box. It is a fat, flat um, sleep surface with nothing else in it. So I would way rather a baby sleep in a box than sleep in a bed with their moms. Absolutely. But we can do better than a box. We really can. These are not any less expensive than buying them a pack and play. So um, the rock and plays, any sort of sitting device, do you see how that's at an angle? Okay, that's inclined sleep. We have chin to chest issue happening there, pinching off baby's airways. Um, these have been recalled, a massive recall. I don't know if you've seen Facebook lately, um, but any sort of incline piece is, um, that's inclined like that. So. Um, you see how that, one thing that you can ask your family since they're really not something that you have no idea what it is. One question you can ask is, well, does it have a buckle to buckle your baby into it? Okay? If they say yes, it's not going to be safe for sleep. Okay? The reason a manufacturer would put a buckle on something is because there's what? What kind of hazard? Why would a manufacturer put falling hazard? Exactly. And if there's a falling hazard, I can guarantee you there's going to be some sort of incline, okay? Um, so any sort of sleeper rock and play thing that they're sitting upright or it comes with a buckle is not going to be safe for sleep. These are called inclined sleepers, and the Fisher-Price device has been recalled. The data on inclined sleepers is getting worse. The more babies have died in these. Um, Consumer Product Safety Commission is noting this and is, um, and is asking for a revision of the rules around these. We don't have a lot of regulations around these things. But the number is up to the 70s now. This just came out today, well, it was yesterday. Okay. Yesterday. Um, and the numbers of babies that have died in inclined sleepers um, is, is quite high. Um, so we want to avoid those. Uh, talk. Um, this actually, an article just came out about this from Consumer Product Safety Commission about we've had two known deaths in these, um, and they are not recommended. Um, it's a, type, a sleeper type that goes into the adult bed. Um, so it kind of tricks parents into thinking that this is, you know, bed sharing. It's, you can do it safely if you have your baby in this device. Sometimes they're called pods or nests. There's different versions. This is the expensive docker tod. I think they're about $300. Um, but right, that, that baby rolls and its face is right into a pillow-like bumper, okay? That's made to put on an adult bed, which is not a flat firm surface. It's way too soft, soft of a surface. So um, these are not safe for sleep. They're great for play, and if you go to their website, they'll say, well, we think the dog is great for sleeping, but the American Academy, some people differ, you know, so they will say right up front that this is not what the American Academy Pediatrics recommends, but they are still saying that it's safe. So um, um, just be aware that your parents love these things, and they get them, they put them down on their registries for their baby showers, and, um, and a lot of people swear by them. And they probably do sleep better in them, which is why their parents are so concerned about So again, they don't meet Consumer Product Safety Commission standards, okay? Anything, at the bare minimum, the device must stand alone to meet safety standards, okay? And something that sits on an adult bed or hooks to an adult bed does not meet the safety recommendations. It has to stand alone, okay? So these are um, over-the-counter monitors um, heart monitoring heart heart rate, oxygen levels. Um, sometimes they wrap around a baby's foot, or sometimes they clip on a diaper, or they go under the mattress and they'll alert you, or an alarm will go off if baby stops breathing um, or heart rate drops. Um, but what we know 
Um, so our concern with this is that parents will use these and not follow safely. Right? I've got so, a niece who slept her kid in bed with her with an amber TV necklace and said, oh, but it's fine because I've got my kid on a baby monitor. We sometimes will buy into this as nurses and physicians because we'll say, okay, I don't want you to do this at home, but it's perfectly safe in here because he's on a monitor. Don't say that because we don't want parents to get the idea that as long as they put their kid on a monitor, they're perfectly safe. They're not. Yeah. So um, uh, there was a study, a controlled study done on these um, this spring, and um, it, they put these on babies in the NICU, and sometimes these monitors um, went off when they shouldn't have, so causing false alarms. You know, think about it at home, right? A false alarm at home, that baby's gonna be in your ER, I'll guarantee you, right? Um, and then some of them didn't go off when they should have. But these babies were on, obviously, hospital grade monitors, which what I tell parents at our safe sleep class is if your baby needs a monitor, your doctor will prescribe you one. And it's not gonna be an over the counter monitor, it's gonna be a hospital grade monitor. No studies have ever shown an association between protection from SIDS, sewage, and monitor use. So this is not why we use monitors at home. A doctor who prescribes a monitor for a baby at home is usually prescribing one for a baby who's on oxygen. Uh, it's not to protect against SIDS. That's a different animal. Okay, so some pack and place, which by the way, we love those. We spend tens of thousands of dollars on them to get them out into our community with the safe sleep education. Um, we love these. They're portable. Um, Crips for Kids sells one um, that you, as a partner, you can purchase them. Um, and they have this safe sleep message all over them in this cute little um, pink and blue and yellow print. Babies sleep alone on their backs in a crib, so it's not only right as safe place for them to sleep, but it's a, it's a teaching device, it's an educational device. But some of them come with, um, not the ones that we use, but come with things that click on like like uh, horizontal like that. So this is like a changing table and a, um, like I don't know, like a play thing or something. They're not safe for sleep. They're okay for wake time. We just don't want babies sleeping in this stuff here. Totally okay. This is the bassinet piece that's raised up. It clips to the side nice flat surface and then as baby grows it drops down this comes off this comes off and that big mattress drops down snaps to the frame and it is perfectly safe for an infant we are uh, uh, actually i believe the weight limit is 35 pounds so that's a good one year old so this is a perfectly safe um it's portable it can go in the bedroom it can go to grandma's house it can go to daycare um excellent sleep space for a baby now guess what graco sells a, a mattress about yay thick that drops into these packet plates really <laughs> yes <laughs> i didn't know that that makes they do sense. we have one at the office that makes sense. so it, it, right so baby gets caught between the mesh and the in the mattress they get caught under the mattress it's way too soft of a surface so th that is not recommended um for a sleeping infant. And people buy them all the time. I have families that'll take our class and they're like, oh boy, I have to take back my crib bumpers, my extra mattress for my pack and play, my blankets, and like totally revamp their entire, you know, baby uh, registry. Okay, just some other products. Another example, do you guys have these here at the hospital, the monitors? Okay, some hospitals, especially ones with NICUs, use those. They're like a swing that goes like this. Right? Instead of like this, it's like this. Um, and they're quite common for NAS babies. Um, so we talk to hospitals to make sure you transition out of those to safe sleep before they go home. Um, NAS babies are an exception to some safe sleep rules because they are so sick and they are so miserable that they need those things. But they are also at high risk for death from some unexpected death. So we have to be very careful to remove those supports as soon as we possibly can. It is so difficult to keep those babies safe. So this product and this product, those are examples of other like pods or nests that go in the adult bed. So kind of like that dot tot, remember? Um, they don't stand alone, way too soft of a surface, swings, um, bouncy seats, anything, right? They fall asleep in that stuff and then they have to be taken out and put into their safe sleep environment. They may not sleep in um, a swing, a bouncy seat. 
I remember the um, first time I heard this talk, I thought, so you're supposed to immediately pull over to the side of the yeah. road if your baby falls asleep? No. You're supposed to take them out as soon as it's safe to do so. Yeah. So with car seats, okay, we want to make sure that our car seats are installed properly. Do you guys have a car seat installed right. person? Okay, perfect. So making sure um, that when we talk to families about car seat safety, that car seat's installed, it's at the correct angle. I mean, we still don't want babies on long car rides in these bucket seats because they're squashed down, right? They can't expand their lungs if they need to, and they're not in a nice open airways okay so when um you get to where you're going baby comes out goes into their safe sleep environment or you hold them i would recommend for um people on long car trips with infants that they stop every hour to make sure that the baby's positioned safely yeah. and to just check things out make sure they're not overheating um and that's a good idea and so oftentimes like even in class like people will come into our safe sleep class or maybe they're in the hospital or for an appointment or maybe we talked about in that training in Missoula, they were worried about um, pediatric patients, like a two-year-old in there, but then they have mom with a baby, right? And that baby's sleeping in a car seat. So make sure that if you have a pediatric patient, then you're offering a safe sleep environment for that infant that is staying in your hospital. For the sibling. For the sibling, yes. That might not be a patient, but can you bring in a pack and play? Like, we don't want your baby sleeping in this car seat. Um, or Usually it's a car seat. It's, it can be harder on pediatric floors to maintain a safe sleep yeah. environment because these, these families are stressed, they want to sleep with their babies. It's harder than it is in a newborn where they haven't established that pattern already. Okay, so lots and lots of tummy time um, to make them strong and be able to roll over. A little bit shorter here. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to kind of go through this a little bit quick, but um, basically, Making sure that all of the photos in your hospital, which I know they are because we've worked very hard in the last couple of years. Um, so, but in the daycare center and in your um, pediatric floors, making sure that you're showing um, safe sleep photos. Um, one way, um, make sure babies are awake in your photos, okay? Any sort of unsafe sleep messaging can get um, in the way of your safe sleep messaging, right? Um, like, for example, we wouldn't have photos of kiddos riding bikes without helmets on the wall. Or, or pregnant, lady smoking, pregnant right? ladies smoking, right? We need to um, practice what we what we preach. Okay? We had a pediatrician in our community who's a huge advocate of our organization. Finance, helps finance us, goes to our events, we go to their office, we teach. Recently, Liz showed me a pamphlet that they have not for any patients. And it talks about their practice, and it has one of those really cute little pictures of babies sleeping on their stomach. I'm like, what the heck? You guys know better. It's a pediatrician's office. I feel like sometimes we're waiting for people, but you have to be vigilant. So I challenge you guys to look at your pamphlets at your hospitals, what you hand out for classes, um, just making sure that we have safe sleep messaging all throughout our hospitals. So we're certified hospitals, and we want to make sure any billboard that we put out, any commercials, any social media, your website, um, has um, safe sleep photos, okay? All right, so as a certified hospital, um, we want you to develop a safe sleep policy. Um, please, please, please make sure you're reviewing that policy as part of the requirements that every single person um, sees that policy and they know what it is. Um, we train your staff, not necessarily us, but um, it can be like, you, I know you guys use this video to show your new hires or to renew your training. We were just here in January to do a training. We love coming here, one, um, because you guys have an incredible hospital and you do excellent work and um, your death rates are really high. So anything we can do to help this area, we're, we're up for. We don't mean your hospital stuff, right? We mean your oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me You're that. suing right? <laughs> and health district too. Yeah, yeah that's all. Thank right. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, you're educating your families. Um, what is your process for education? What do you What do you do besides model safe sleep? What is your What do you What tool are you guys using? We I know they talk about in pre clinic and then on this chart we talk about and we have videos that we show them before they move to watch safe sleep video. Okay. 
and then that you would give them a handout as well. Okay, good. Awesome. Just great. That's a nice basket. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so we educate, we replace your um, receiving blankets um, in the nursery and the NICU with the wearable blankets to model um, no loose bedding in the crib. That includes your peds. Um, your med surge is also yep. your activation so You bet. We know you don't have a NICU, but that's what you have the nursery is. Yeah. Yeah. Great, that you um, evaluate your program at an absolute minimum once a year. I would highly encourage you to do an audit like once a month. And it's totally internal, right? Yeah, it's fun. You guys yeah. do it, bring it back to one of your meetings. Like, hey guys, I found, you know, one out of our three cribs, um, somebody wasn't swaddled safe. Or we had a big teddy bear in the crib or something. We like, call it you like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in at Cooney, when we started doing the audit, uh, 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 audit, audit, audit uh, what we discovered was if you don't check, like it start creeping back, back into the crib and stuffed animals and, and people just throw things in the crib because it's convenient. A stethoscope goes in there, a, a thermometer goes in there, a bowl syringe, find a safe place for it so that your crib remains empty except for the baby. Um, and, and as much as you may know it when you first set it up, people get, you know, it's convenient and you're, you're rushed you're, and so things show up in the crib. So other part of the Gold Certified Hospital, which is you, um, you do community and media outreach on safe sleep in your community. Um, I would highly encourage you, if you have a childbirth class, um, we have a, if you guys want to partner and do safe sleep um, as a part of your childbirth class or um, prenatal class or whatever you guys do, we're happy to provide you sleep sacks to give to your families um, that do take this class. So um, we love to partner with you guys on that. Affiliate with or become a Cribs for Kids partner. Guess what? That's Inland Northwest's foundation for you. We are your affiliate partner for that. Um, and then you provide, like we talked about, a safe sleep alternative for families um, who might not have that um, here at your hospital. So again, opening up that safe sleep conversation, please always ask, where is your baby going to sleep when you get home? And open up that safe sleep discussion. Okay? You guys are so important. Dr. What they, have, they will listen yeah. to you and they won't listen to me. Um, because you're a nurse. So um, believe in yourself, believe in the power that you have to save lives by doing this. We are relying on you, we can't do it ourselves, and you're on the first line. You're the ones that are gonna see this. You're gonna be talking to these parents, you're developing a relationship with them. A physician may come by for a what? 10 minutes a day, tops? You know, or a nurse is there for a shift. So you can get to know them, you can get to know what, what it's like for them at home. So you can help them problem solve the way through this. Um, so, we're going to talk about the barriers, Dr. Webb. Yes. Um, okay. So in our mother baby units, um, uh, bed sharing, we kind of already talked about that. It might be a barrier that you see. Um, skin, the skin care, um, fatigued medicated caregiver, extra blankets and hats, anything on this list that you might, that you guys want to talk about? We can see sleep sack availability right there. But is there another one that you guys want to point out that's a problem for you that you say, yeah, that sounds great, but that's what I want to hear about. Mother baby unit. Anybody have something that they want to share with us that would make it difficult to do these things? No? It's all easy? <laughs> it's okay? Right. Do all your families vaccinate their kids? Okay. So they don't. Um, and, and that's not surprising. Again, what I want to reiterate there is don't alienate them by saying, oh, you know, you can't do that. You got to do, you know. So you educate and then you give them resources. So what I tell my families is I will be happy to look at your websites if you will with mine. And I give them the CDC and I give them healthychildren.org, which is the parent portal for the American Academy of Pediatrics. So that can help if they look at those websites. Just say, please, keep an open mind. There's some things you might learn from this that will help you make your decision. We get them on the same page as you. We all agree we want your baby to be healthy and safe, right? Every parent wants that. So just how to get there is what you work on. Anything from the perspective of you you folks on the um, uh, med search floor? Um, talk about the sheets. Talk about the sheets. Anything else that you see that's an issue? I just find it very rare that I can convince a family to get their kids they're just not comfortable with the kiddos upstairs. They're the very old, like tall metal cribs. And, and the kiddos sick, so the mom wants to be close. 
Yeah. So um, is there anything you can do to make those cribs more appealing? She or she? Oh, I don't know. Take it to my director and we'll see. Yeah, we would love to get your directors involved. So yeah, um, and and then if you're stuck with that, and that's the reality of the situation. Again, you cuddle up with the other things. Okay, how are we going to make this safe? Let's keep the blankets away. Um, you know, it looks like your digging might be a little hot in that. Let's let's you not know, hold it. It doesn't need that hot. Go ahead. I think a big thing that we're going into is like the auxiliary groups that make blankets to teach yeah. families, which seems like a really great gift, but then they always get used. So talk about them as really useful things for Tommy. That's something that you can emphasize. It's important for the babies. When they do a lot of tummy time, they increase their frontal tone. So it's like core training, right? If you when you go to the gym, and that will actually help save their lives. They they'll be more able to pull themselves out of a dangerous situation if they have more tummy time on their way. Look at this beautiful blanket. That's going to be so great on the floor when you do tummy time. Talk about the use of that blanket in a safe way. And of course, we wouldn't want to use this at night, but this would be great on the floor. You know, talk about it like that. Um, and I hear you. And we did have to ban the man patterns from our, our group because they were they were really pushing these hats for babies to wear. And so we did go with a group that quilted. We sometimes ask them to change the emphasis of what they're making for us. So they made crib covers that weren't like baby covers, they were for the, the, the NICU for the, you know, the isolate. Um, we ran out a little kerfluffle with the American Heart Association yes, because they had a campaign, big hearts for, big hats for little babies or something like that. And they showed all oh, these babies sleeping in these hats, you know, and we we're like, no. <laughs> so we, we engaged them at the national level and they said, well, we can't change it for this year, we'll change. So, so what we've recommended to different hospitals is hook it, like truly get a tummy time brochure and stick it to that blanket and say, you know, this is not, a, this blanket is not for sleep, but it's awesome for tummy time. Um, so you can encourage one of the safe sleep recommendations with the blanket. On your note, so you, you have a policy, you have a hospital policy that says you can't share sleep with your baby. Share that policy with the family. Use it to be, um, you know, like, hey, I am totally, you know, you guys know the conversation. Totally understand your baby's sick and you want to do this, but you know, it's really, really dangerous. Educate on safe sleep and truly pull out the form that they have and use it with them and say, I totally get it. Um, maybe. Just some other ways, maybe mom sitting next to the crib, and because you have to put the side up, right? That's that's a safety policy, right? So just like not allowing bed sharing, should also be a safety policy, right? Snuggle so in with that baby before they're asleep, and then say when your baby falls asleep, we're going to move them over to the crib. You know, talk, helping them to problem solve with you how to keep the baby safe. I get it. They've got you've got more things on their plate, but we also have this. Um, we have the notion that it's never going to happen to me, right? Can you think of some families that you have worked with? Maybe that bed sharing family that was just here, like, they just don't think it's going to happen to them. And when we know that it happens 3,700 times every single year um, in the United States. Um, I'm one of these families, um, not that didn't think they would, it wouldn't happen to them, but um, I, my my son Mason um, died in 2003. Actually, I was teaching Kimberly school in the same exact school um, when he, um, I left him at the daycare or at my friend's house. We should, we had duplexes because my husband's the firefighter and I was a teacher, obviously. And um, I'd been home on maternity leave for three months and I brought him over. It was one of probably my first couple weeks back to work. And I brought him to my friend's house and I said, she's like, hey, do you want to grab his pack and play and bring it over? I'm like, oh no, he's fine. He takes his nap on the couch. Okay, just put pillows on the floor in case he rolls. Um, and he, I get a phone call that makes him stop breathing. And um, he had rolled into the back of the couch. He was also covered in a heavy quilt. So he had rolled into the back of the couch and had that pressure of that heavy quilt on him 
She had left for less than 10 minutes. She went upstairs to make a phone call and didn't see that he had rolled. Um, and so it can happen to anybody. Um, but, you know, in 2003, we didn't have the Safe to Sleep campaign. We had Back to Sleep, right? That's all we knew. We didn't know how dangerous a soft service was. We didn't know how dangerous couch sleeping was or bed sharing. Um, but now we do. And that's why I do what I do. Um, you know, it, it, Kimberly was affected by it. I guarantee you she was, how old are you? Because Mason said if his birthday is coming up. So you were little. Yeah. So she remembered. I mean, so um, please, please take a minute and talk to your family. Okay, five minutes. Look them in the eye. Just take a breath. Talk about safe sleep because really that's all we have, right, is education. That's what we have to give these families. What they do at home, you can't control. But if you can give those, give that safe sleep message, talk, share Mason's story. Um, please, that's what, that's why I share my story. Um, and it is not easy for us to do it either. No. <laughs> I have been impressed with her. Thank you. So I want to share with you. Um, a video, and uh, there's a couple hospitals that actually use this for their safe sleep education and their discharge. Um, but I show this, we show this, every single training that we do, every single, I don't care if there's two people in the room or, well, we probably had a crowd of 60 before. Um, it's very impactful. Um, it's a story, it's put out by Charlie's Kids Foundation. Um, and um, I have some board, board books for you um, that they put out to do their safe sleep education. So it's another tool to use. It's a board book and it has a safe sleep tips on the back and it has this sweet little story um, that shows one of my favorite lines is, um, baby, you'll sleep safely over there. And it has this picture of the baby sleeping in a sleep sack in the crib away from there. It shows the adult, adult bed right here. So, you know, this is another way. You guys know how difficult it is. You know, you need different ways to educate families. And this is a very unique way to also push literacy, right? <laughs> so if you have any literacy money, daycare, um, maybe, you know, it could be something uh, for your family. So I want to make sure that you take some home with you to the daycare for your family. So, okay. All right. I remember feeling a little bit anxious on the day he was born. The nine months leading up to his birth was just full of anticipation and excitement. It was just so thrilling. I mean, it was scary, but she was perfect. Compared to mm -hmm. when he was born, it was just amazing to hear his cry and see his face. Oh, the coolest thing was just how in love I was with him. I didn't have any worries besides what type of I was going to <laughs> Everything was great. She was beautiful. Um, when we found Charlie, we knew something was wrong. Uh, I went to work that day and everything was fine. Uh, I expected to come home and everything be fine. Um, we had everybody went to sleep. She was already asleep. I sat down on the couch watching TV um, and I nodded off to sleep with Charlie sitting on my chest. I woke up to my baby not responding. No one found him until you know, it was too late and he was blue. Because I tried CPR on her. Um, I wasn't at the point where I was believing that this could be really happening to our baby. So, I mean, I'm still thinking, like, okay, maybe she's, she's going to wake up out of it. And then when this came, uh, um, I learned that. It was a co-bedding accident where her father fell asleep with her on the couch and she was accidentally smothered. It wasn't until we had to make the call to stop CPR that I knew that he was gone. When my daughter passed away, every dream and hope that I had for her also was gone. Even though my wife was a kindergarten teacher and, and I'm a pediatrician, it happened to us, and it can happen to anyone. 
you find yourself when you go through what is and why. But we know that there are things that you can do to lower your risk for SIDS deaths. Baby, my sleep on I always sleep on that bag. I always sleep in the crib. ABC is a, is a great way to remember it. Alone back crib. A stands for alone. The baby needs to be in their crib without bumpers and blankets and stuffed animals. Yeah, a lot of parents say that I've had, you know, three children already. They've slept in bed with me. This was really beneficial for, for mom bonding to baby. But the evidence suggests that it's not safe. The baby needs to be on their back. Because when babies sleep on their side or on their belly, uh, their face is up against the mattress um, or up against the pillow. And as a result, they can't breathe. And the baby needs to be in their crib, in their own space. If you can't afford a crib, then just dial 211 or get a hold of Cradle to Cincinnati because they can provide you with a free crib. It's important that the parents follow the ABCs of Safe Sleep, but it's also very important that the parents tell everyone and anyone else who's going to be with the baby about these rules. You know, our parents didn't have these precautions to go by. And so if they revert back to what they did with us, then they're not following what we know now. The message has changed because the science has told us that something's new. Whether it's grandparents, daycare workers, babysitters, it's really important that that person put the baby alone on their back and in the crib. If they can't do um, what's expected of them, then they'll deserve to watch the baby. Because this is your child and it really matters how this is handled. You know, we share information about the best diapers to buy and the, you know, the best food to feed our baby. So we should also be sharing information about safe sleep. You're going to be tired and the stress level is going to be high. You just have to have your network of support, you know, family members, friends, neighbors. There's a community of people out there that can all help. I don't want to scare anybody. I just want them to let people know it's very real. Who wouldn't want to do something simple to save their baby's life? I think if I could tell a new parent anything, it would be, I know it's hard. I've been in your shoes. But... Keep your baby safe. Put your baby alone on their back in a crib for every single sleep. So you met um, Dr. Hakey um, and his wife Mara and um, their son Charlie. And um, Dr. Hakey um, will tell you the one time I didn't fall in safe sleep. The one time my son died. And that's all it takes, it's one time. Um, and, you know, and he's a doctor, right? And it happened to him. So um, share Charlie's story, um, share Mason's story, um, share Hattie's story. She was the one that um, got the blanket wrapped around her head at daycare. Um, share those stories because sometimes families think that it can't happen to them because they might be low risk, right? Um, but these little board books, um, we're, we give them out at our safe sleep class. They're like $2 a piece when you buy so many. They're so sweet. Little safe sleep, sleep tips on the back. Um, but um, thanks to Charlie's kids for letting us share that video. And then of course, Grips for Kids, um, the hospital certification. So thank you um, guys for doing um, such incredible work in your community. You are a leader on safe sleep. Every time I see a Facebook post on Gritman, it's, you know, that baby's in a sleep sack. Your your banner out here has a baby sleeping in a logo and sleep sack. Like, that's incredible. And to ensure that your daycare workers are here, you know, it's a wraparound. We're all doing this together, and it's going to take us doing this time and time and time again until we're sick of hearing about it. But I'm pleased to use myself and Dr. Webb, our foundation, as a resource. If you come across anything, you're with a family, and you're like, you need help with the sheet thing, please let us know. We're happy to educate docs. Um, I don't know, whatever. You guys are always sending us, we're always educating your nursing staff. So you guys are awesome. So thank you so much for coming.